We uh, run these leadership institutes um, many, many times in the United States. We did uh, a couple in Canada, and this is our, and we did one in Central Europe, and this is our first time in Israel. We're very happy to be here. We have over 900 people who have been through our leadership institutes, and there are people who run very traditional agencies and who work for government agencies, as well as people who work who run the most progressive agencies like Lynn and, and Annette, who you'll hear later on. So um, I get to uh, stand between you and lunch. So uh, I'll talk to you just for a, a short while. But I want to talk to you a little bit about leadership. So to be a leader, you need to, uh, you need to know how to change organizations, but you also need to know what you need to change. You need to know where you're going. And so that's what we're going to talk about just for a few minutes this morning. Uh, this is a statement by a person with disabilities who you know, spoke to how uh, our thinking about people with disabilities is changing. So the field is changing. He says, in the 60s, you treated us like plants. You fed us, clothed us, kept us warm. Now, I entered this field during this next phase when we thought we could teach people everything. And as Lynn said, I cannot imagine anything more annoying than getting home from a day at work and having my husband say, now we have your table setting program and your clothes washing program. And you know, nobody really wants to be programmed to death. And so while people do have things that they want to learn, usually they're not the things that, that we're going to teach them. And so, you know, there's this uh, quote that's from Star Trek. It says that people want to boldly go where everyone else has gone before. So really that's all. I was planning a meeting at a hotel in Florida and the woman who I was speaking to at the hotel, she said, I said to her, so is the whole hotel accessible? Because we only want to hold our meeting if every place is accessible to people who use wheelchairs. And she said, well, you know, this restaurant is accessible and this restaurant, but the fancy restaurant, the expensive one, not accessible. I said, well, that, then that's a deal breaker for us. We can't hold our meeting there. We're not interested in your hotel. She said, so what are these people? They want to go everywhere? Yeah. <laughs> so let's start with that assumption. They want to go everywhere. So um, for most people with disabilities um, in the United States and probably here as well, not much has changed. Although we know a lot more so Lynn was talking about closing her group home. She closed her group homes 25 years ago. So why is this still news? I don't know. How, well, how she can still make her living going around talking to audiences, I don't know. Because what she's talking about, she did 25 years ago. If I were to talk about what I did 25 years ago and try to convince you that you should get email, I don't think I'd, anybody would want to listen to me. So. Uh, while there are a lot of exciting things happening for people with disabilities, the vast majority of people still live very similarly to the way people lived when I started in this field as a direct support worker in a group home. People always say, I know you don't like group homes, but you should come see our group home. So I go to see, you know, and except for the fact that I don't think we had the choking poster when I was a, a direct support staff, they're pretty much the same, and the difference is it's a life that somebody else is in charge of. So the real flip here, the real thing that has to change, and that is changing, and that certainly would be different in Lynn's organization, and Annette's, who you'll hear about later, is instead of staff being in charge of people with disabilities, people with disabilities are in charge of their own lives, People, the staff's job is to help people figure out what, the, what they're interested in, to experience things that they might not have experienced. So if you say to somebody, would you like to go horseback riding, but they've never seen a horse, you know, so the, the job is to expose them to possibilities and then to give them opportunities to try things and do things and then to just support them. So when the, the staff that work with people in Lynn's organization go to work, they don't tell people what they're going to do that day. They report to the person, they work for the person, and they say, what are we going to do today? And she says, we're, you know, we're going to go to the store, and we're going to buy fabric, and we're going to work on my quilt, and then we're going to go out to lunch and you know, meet a friend. 
whatever this person wants to do that day is what gets done that day. So I do wonder whether any other fields where we're as stuck and, you know, and this idea of, you know, is there a heart surgeon who says, well, you know, I know there's all these newfangled technologies for heart surgery, but I, I was trained in the 70s. I just like to do heart surgery the way I learned. But yeah, I, I know uh, more people die, but you know, so, uh, you know, well, that's how we kind of are. Like we're still doing our work the way we did in the 70s and 80s, and so much has changed. I don't know that there's any other um, minority group that would tolerate it, that would accept you know, if we picked any other minority group and said, you can only have what we were doing in the 70s and 80s, I don't know any other group that would go along with it or any other staff or professionals who would not only go along with it, but defend it. So that kind of stagnation is, uh, is what we really have to work against. So we have to ask the right questions. You know, Lynn asked her, the folks in her organization, uh, the people that they supported, do you like where you live? And they all said yes. But when she asked, how would you like your life to be different? That's a different kind of question. And then you get some real answers and maybe not such comfortable answers because we all are in this field for all the right reasons. You know, people are in this field to do right by people with disabilities. But very often we have to admit that we could have been doing more or we could have been doing differently. And all the various reasons like Lynn just mentioned, well, there's not the money or, you know, our board won't let us, or even though the people we support would like to live more independently, their parents want something different. But if you're an agency that supports adults with disabilities, your real obligation is to the adults that you support. That doesn't mean that you don't include families and value families and help them to come along, but your, your obligation is to the people who, you, who, who, uh, who your organization supports. So uh, sometimes staying where we are is just more comfortable and you don't have to think about the fact that, you know, with the best of intentions, we've been limiting and isolating and underestimating people. If you, for example, run, you know, at least uh, the pre-vocational programs in the U.S., you know, if you run a day program and you say, well, we, you know, people come to this day program because eventually they're going to get jobs, well, the research is in. We know that we're just kidding ourselves. I think it's self-soothing behavior. Like, we like to pretend that that's why people come to our day program. There might be other reasons. It might just be more convenient or it might be what we're used to. But people don't get jobs from going to day programs and then graduating to uh, a job. It just, I mean, the, it just, uh, it, it, I mean, there are probably examples of it happening, but it, uh, by and large, it doesn't happen. So as Steve pointed out, uh, we know that people have better outcomes in community settings. And I don't know how much of this you can see. And by the way, we will be happy to send all of you. Uh, I know Avital will have a, an email list with all of you. We could send you all, all of these presentations so that you have these. Uh, so this just shows that people who live in community settings do better in terms of their social skills, their language and communication skills, their self-care skills, in all kinds of areas. We know that people make more progress in, uh, when they live more independently. So you've all heard this saying, forgive them for they know not what they do. So here's uh, what somebody said, forgive them for they do not what they know. So we know. It's there. I mean, there's no reason why we're not serving people more uh, individually and serving people one by one in a very responsive and customized way. But we, and we know what it's, it's what people want and we know it produces better outcomes, but we don't do it uh, or we don't do it enough for enough people. And I think it's time to just um, forgive ourselves and move on. So this is Maya Angelou. She says, I did then what I knew how to do. And now that I know better, I do better. So uh, I, I said to the, the small group that gathered yesterday, one of the things I love about this field is that everything that you ever did 20 or 25 years ago, you could cringe about. You'd be a little embarrassed about now. But 
That means that when we look back at what we think we're doing that's right and good now, 25 years from in the future, when we look back, we'll realize that what we think is good now is not, you know, we'll say, I can't believe I thought that was good. Now we know so much better. So I think that's an exciting thing about our field. It moves quickly. Whatever language you've adopted, whatever words you use, pretty soon they're no good anymore and you better not say them. So, you know, it, it keeps us on our toes and it, it's an exciting thing to work in a field like that. So. Um, the biggest difference between those who are making meaningful change and those who are stuck is this, is that they decided, and I, I think Lynn might have said this, like people who make this change aren't people who have more money, they're not people who have different regulations, they're not people who have a board that's comprised a certain way, they're people who made the decision that they're not going to allow people to live lives that limit and isolate them. So if you are, are gonna talk about the future of the field, it's nice to have a crystal ball. So there's my crystal ball. So here are my predictions. We will offer supports that are responsive to what people want, balancing what's important to people with what's important for them. So people say, oh, so if you're gonna let people live the life they want, you're gonna let them run into the highway and get run over? Well, no. So you're going to let them, if they have diabetes, eat as much sugar as they want? Well, no. So it's a matter of figuring out what's important to people, what they want for their lives, and balancing that with what's important for them, balancing choice and risk. And that's a process that has to be done not on behalf of the person, but right alongside with the person. So um, these are, there's a report from R.A. Naiman's group and um, con combined with two other uh, self-advocacy groups in the United States. So Ari's group is the Autistic Self-Advocacy Network and with another group called Self-Advocates Becoming Empowered and the National Youth Leadership Network, they said this, here's when our rights are restricted. When we have to do what we're told and staff watch our every move, when rules are about what works better for the agency or the staff, when activities or the freedom to come and go are limited to what the provider will allow, when our ability to have friends is limited by the agency, when we're restricted from becoming, from demonstrating our sexuality and being sexual people, and when people make decisions for us, limiting our choices about where to live, who to live with, food, clothing, et cetera. And they, they conclude by saying, we want to make our own plans and get support to carry out our plans, even when staff or the provider don't agree with our decisions. So remembering that um, Martin Luther King said, I have a dream. He didn't say, I have an annual plan and quarterly goals, and I learned to do laundry. Don't think he cared. Um, so the day is approaching when people won't accept the mediocre services that we offer. People don't want to live with groups where we put them together. They don't want to fill a slot, as Steve talked about this morning. If you have a five-bed group home or a six-bed or a 12-bed and you have an opening, the way the finances work, you've got to fill that bed. I mean, I've run group homes, so I know this from all perspectives. And, um, you know, if you serve people one by one, then each person can live the life that they want. So, uh, you know, I think we think to ourselves, but, you know, we're good people and we're only doing what, I mean, we don't want what's what's wrong, what's, what's not good for people. We want what's best for people. So if we're good people and we want what's best for people, what's wrong with that? I mean, somebody's got to decide what's best for people, right? So here's how I explain it to my students. I say to them, uh, I'm a good person. I want what's best for you. Uh, I think you should get up early in the morning and do some exercise. I think the women should dress a little more ladylike. Steve says in the winter they dress in their pajamas like they're going to bed, and in the summer they dress like they're on their way to the beach. So, you know, a little more ladylike would be nice. Starbucks, you have Starbucks in Israel? Uh, nothing wrong with Starbucks? You do? No? Okay, well, Starbucks, it's a coffee shop. It's very expensive, like a cup of coffee, it costs, you know, in U.S. dollars, four or five dollars. So I say that nothing wrong with Starbucks, but uh, you could make a whole pot of coffee for the cost. 
Uh, you should have a healthy breakfast. Facebook, I don't understand it. If you want to go on Facebook a couple of times a week, that's okay, but don't waste your time. So, you know, as I, I say to my students, I'm not a bad person. Culturally, we're different. This is what I, my, the life is that I would design for them. They're probably happy I'm not in charge of their life. I'm happy they're not in charge of my life because you know, culturally we're different. Sometimes I, I have a, my students say, you know, what do you do in the morning? Like, what's your routine when you wake up in the morning? First you brush your teeth and then you take a shower. First you take a shower. First you watch TV and have a cup of coffee and then you brush your teeth. You know, everybody has their own routine. If anybody had to do the routine of the person sitting next to them, you'd be all thrown off and it wouldn't be comfortable for you. So, you know, that's what happens when you have somebody in charge of a group home who says, we're all going to do it this way because this is what I'm used to. So it can never, you can never provide quality services when you serve people together. We have rules for people with disabilities like these. Um, we have rules like this in the dorms at the university, but we don't even pretend that they follow them. I was uh, uh, talking to a group of people and a woman in the audience said, I don't see what's wrong with these rules. I have rules like this for my children uh, because A, they're not children and B, they're not your children. So that's what's wrong because none of us would tolerate living with rules like this as adults. People should have homes, not home-like environments. Uh, I was, uh, for a while, I was traveling a lot on business, and I, I um, was on the plane, and somebody sa I said, every single week I travel to this state that's, you know, a three-hour plane ride away, and he said, oh, it must be like a vacation. Oh, no, it's nothing like a vacation. It's, it's it, no more vacation-like than what we provide, we like to call home-like. So I say a home is where you choose wh who you live with or whether you live alone, if someone says, whose place is this? If somebody came into my house and said, whose place is this? I'd say, well, it's my house, my and my family's. But if you ask somebody who lives in a group home, whose place is this? They'll say, well, it's the staff's place or the agency's place. They know it's not their place. It's not their home. And if, if they do very well, they're going to be graduated. That means kicked out, go to a different setting. If they do poorly, they're going to have to go back to a different setting. So. Uh, home is a place where if you live there, you have a key to your place. If you don't live there, you don't have a key. And where you don't have to ask permission to when you eat, where you eat, who, you know, when you shower, if you can make a phone call, if you can have a pet, etc. So uh, my prediction too, we'll recognize that quality of life has a whole lot to, more to do with personal relationships and a sense of community than it does with any of these skills. You know, if you think about... It, uh, what's good about your life? What makes life good? So think about it. None of you thought, because I'm a great parallel parker, or because I can make a wonderful souffle, or the best spaghetti sauce of anybody. You thought about, you didn't think about skills that you learned. You thought about people you love and people who love you. And that's really what makes for a good life. So we're going to stop making decisions about people's lives based on where there's an opening or a slot. We'll stop assuming that there's some relationship between where you live and how significant your disability. You, you have a more significant disability, you need to live in a more structured place, a bigger place, more beds. We'll get over that. Because people uh, who Lynn's organization supports have all levels of disability. It's not just for people who have more skills or more abilities, it's for everybody. So people get more support if they have more significant disabilities, but they can still be in charge of their own lives. We'll decide finally that it's unethical to uh, not only um, unethical but illogical to respond to people's attempts to assert a degree of control over their lives by imposing greater and greater amount of control over them. So when people protest the amount of control that we assert over them, we um, offer them more control. You don't like how much control we're offering? Well, we'll offer you more control. So even if you don't use aversive procedures or seclusion or restraint, so much of what we do to people in the name of positive behavior practices is really 
in fact, controlling and coercive. We figure uh, if you act out, if you have a behavior problem, well, you need a more structured environment. We like to use the word structured. It makes us feel better. We mean restrictive. And then you act out even more. You say, heck no, you're not going to be in charge of me. Because I think there's no greater human impulse than to be in charge of your own life. No matter whether you have a disability or don't, no matter the severity of your disability, you, the greatest human impulse is to be in charge of your own life. So you act out. We offer you more control and structure and restrictiveness. You escalate your behavior because you're going to demonstrate that you are going to be in charge of your own life. We escalate our, our structure and restrictiveness. Well, I knew he needed more structure and would give him even more structure. And then here we go round and round and we never get out of that cycle. So we, make, uh, we ask all the wrong questions. We ask questions like this. We want to remake people in our image. We want people to be like us. When if we, um, if somebody, you know, if you were going to be in charge of my life, I would hope that you would ask these kinds of things. What am I good at? What do I like? What's frustrating to me? What would I change about my life? Who loves me? What are my dreams? I always think if we picked a college major the way, you know, when you go to college, you pick what you're going to study. Uh, if, if I did it the way we do for people with disabilities, so we look at people with disabilities, we say, what's, what are they worst at? What are their needs? That's what we need to fix, right? So if I had done it that way, when I went to college, I would say, well, I was very bad at math and science. So, you know, I didn't do well in calculus. So I, maybe I should major in calculus because that's where my needs were, obviously. But no, we don't do that to ourselves. We say, what do I like? What's interesting? How do I want to spend my life? That's what I'm going to major in in college. So when you have... Um, a lot of behavior problems in your, in your agency. I always say to people, you could save money on people to come in and evaluate your program because the people you serve are already evaluating your program. And if you have a lot of behavior problems, if people's behaviors are challenging to you, they're telling you that they're not happy. And there's something that needs to change about that. So you know, it's our challenge to figure out how to hire people who don't want to control other people, but want to support people and help them to live the life. It's a big switch. You know, a lot of, I mean, a lot of people went into this field because they kind of like being important and bossing people around. And so it's a big switch to say, now you're not in charge of them, they're in charge of you. And it might not be the same people who were so good at the one who are going to be good at the other. So it's a challenge to figure out how do you interview and hire people who really can put their heart into helping people design and live a life of their choice. We'll realize that you can't give what you don't get. This is what Lynn was talking about. You can't ask staff to treat the people they support as valued, important, respected people who have impact on their lives if you don't treat them as valued, respected, important people who have impact on their lives. So how are we going to make sure that direct care people ha are valued and important and have impact on their organizations and have choices so that they can offer that to the people that they support? The golden rule being staff do unto others as the administration does unto them. And so sometimes that's not pretty. So we need to treat staff as we want them to treat other people. We'll recognize that institutions and other highly controlled places aren't good for people. They'll become a thing of the past. You can't, I mean, we're very good at the language. I always say if we could be half as good as our mission statements, we'd be pretty good. We write lovely mission statements, but we don't really, I mean, we know all the words to use, but we don't really do that. And you really can't do that in a controlled, congregate kind of saying. So people want to be in charge of their own lives. And more and more people with disabilities are making sure that we know that. And people with disabilities should be you know, on your boards and on your committees and involved in um, making decisions and policy decisions as such. We'll recognize that loneliness might be the biggest disability of all and figure out ways to get out of people's way. One, pe one reason people are lonely is because we've stood right by their side. They go out into the community. We're right there next to them. Well, nobody's going to interact with them because they figure you're there with them. Those needs are met. So um, I like this author. She says, 
By our very natures, humans are prepared to be social animals. We are biologically and psychologically prepared for attachment and bonding. Our need for, for connection is, from birth and beyond, a fundamental survival need. And the same author says, if you could do just one thing that would lengthen your life, help you stay psychologically and physically healthy, and support your healing when you did become ill, you would maintain strong connections to other people. The effects of belongingness are so potent that if they could be bottled, they would need, in the United States, Food and Drug Administration approval. That's the, the government agency that approves medications. So we need to get out of our own way and stop isolating people from family and from the potential to form relationships. I think we ourselves don't really believe that anybody wants to be friends with the people we support or hire the people we support. I think our own heart of heart beliefs about that stands in the way. We need a new generation of leadership who are really going to, that's really the key. I mean, if the agencies that have made this shift are agencies that have decided well, it's leaders who make those decisions. So there's no recipe or formula. Sometimes people say, I came to Leadership Institute, but I still didn't know how to do it. So I need to call Lynn. She needs, I need to do whatever she did. For each agency, it's going to be different. Your agency is different from every other one. So it, there's only one magic formula. There's only one recipe, and that's to put one foot in front of another and make progress every day towards this. Here's what we used to think. We used to think our job was to offer choices and follow the schedule and get people to comply. And now we know we really need to listen to people, respond to people and families' desires, help people get jobs, really help people be, you know, not just in the community, but of the community. Uh, this guy, Michael Small, I don't know if you've seen his work, he says the goal is to have a beautiful life, not a beautiful plan. It doesn't matter what your plan says on paper, it matters what the outcomes are and what, what your life really is. So when you think about making these changes within your um, organizations, you might, um, it might seem impossible. But then again, carrying a car on a bicycle might sound impossible, or it might seem a little scary. Um, I don't recommend letting your babies bathe with your boa constrictor, but they both seem very happy in this picture, so maybe it's okay. So um, here's a guy. This is not a disability expert. Let's see. It says plug in or do something. Luckily, this is my last slide, so we'll get rid of that, and maybe we'll... So this guy was the... Um, football coach at Notre Dame University. He says there are four essential things in life, and I think this is true for all of us. Something to do, something to someone to love, something to believe in, and something to hope for. And if we could offer the people we support that, uh, you know, along with ourselves, I think we'd, we'd have a very um, much happier world for all of us. So. Uh, I'm going to end there, and we will open it up to a few minutes of questions for bo either Lynn or me, so or both. We can fight. In the process of closing the institutions, did you try to bring them back to their families and uh, offer them a, a support system? Uh, no, uh, everyone that was living in our group homes, they were, they ranged from size of 15 beds to eight beds. So they were already not living with their families and nor did they want to. So everyone went into their own uh, flat or home. When I was hearing uh, you speak, uh, I, w I thought about something I've been thinking about for a long time and also we experienced and I think we've heard about it today. but. And organizations have invested interests, and, and they have invested interests both in the way they work, in, their, in, in the staff they hire, in the funding that they get, in the buildings that they own. Um, and I think that I would really like to hear, but how do you th what do you think is the process of trying to change that, both in terms of practices, which is what you spoke about, but also in terms, I think, of policy, because that's where we can also try to change organizations' invested interests. Taking that. Well, um, well, I, you know, I, I do think it's just a matter of, uh, you know, I, I, when we ask, I, I once said to Lynn after listening to her speak, 
Do people come up to you all the time and say, mentor me? Because I feel like if I were still running an organization that ran group homes, I would say to Lynn, I want to do what you did. But she said, no, people don't. People like the idea. They like talking about it, but they really don't do it. So I don't know that there is any magic answer to what organizations need to do. You need to convince who the decision makers are. You need to make sure the regulations allow you to serve people more on a more one-by-one -one basis. In terms of money, and Lynn alluded to this, we overserve people, you know. So I, we all know that it's a disservice to underserve to give somebody less service than they need. It is just as much of a disservice to overserve people. And the vast majority of people with disabilities don't need 24/7 support. They don't need somebody uh, overseeing them or supervising them 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And not only don't need it, don't want it. Very few people need line of sight supervision, but we provide it to everybody because that's what we're used to. So when we redistribute the money based on what people really need rather than what we're used to providing, there will be more money to spread around more equitably for more people. The only thing I would add to that was the, the most difficult thing for us was to decide that we were not going to support people with disabilities in congregate arrangements. Once we decided that, well then, you know, the cat's out of the bag, the train leaves the station, and you figure it out. You just figure it out. I wanted to say thank you for the inspiring lecture because uh, as you talked, I, I, I figured it out and I was telling myself they are not talking about people with disabilities, they are talking about people. That's what I want, want for my mother, for my ex. Yeah. That's what he wants for me, so thank you very much. Very Absolutely. I wanted to know if you feel you've really been able to break the box of the label, the title that often really prevents looking at the true needs of the individual in adulthood, let alone in childhood, but let's say adulthood. I'm, I, I just want to say one other thing. I feel uniquely positioned to ask this question because I just came from a committee meeting about my son. Uh -huh. And I don't feel that I've seen a way that we can break the box open for his future. I do think you're right about moving away from the labels because when people live next door to just a private citizen, that private citizen knows that person is Bob, not as having OCD or not as having an intellectual dis. It's Bob. And Bob feeds my cat when I'm gone. I mean, yes. I do, th I mean, have we totally done that? No, I mean, we still deal with the bureaucracy and the funding and regulators, regulations that are, still use a lot of labels. But in the day-to-day -day life of the people we support, it's almost non-existent.